Lesson 5, User Defined Functions Part 1, User Defined Functions Introduction User Defined Functions, UDFs, are routines that perform calculations, computations and return a value scalar, singular, or a table. UDFs can be embedded in queries, constraints, and computed columns. The code that defines a UDF may not cause side effects that affect the database state outside the scope of the function, that is, the UDF's code is not allowed to modify data in tables or to invoke a function that has side effects, for example, RAND. In addition, the UDF's code can only create table variables and cannot create or access temporary tables. Also, the UDF's code is not allowed to use dynamic SQL. Scalar UDF's return a single, scalar, value. They can be specified where scalar expressions are allowed, for example, in a query, constraint, computed column, and so on. Scalar UDFs have several syntactical requirements, they must have a begin, end block defining their body. They must be schema qualified when invoked, unless invoked as stored procedures with exec, as in exec my function 3, 4. They do not allow emitting optional parameters, ones that have default values, when invoked, rather, you must at least specify the default keyword for those. TSQL UDFs are typically faster than CLR UDFs when the main cost of their activity pertains to set-based data manipulation, as opposed to procedural logic and computations. In the function's header you specify its name, define the input parameters, and define the data type of the return value. This code creates the fngetCarName function which accepts a model name as input and returns a string with the car name and car model. To test the function, run the following queries. Part 2 UDFs used in default constraints. You can use scalar UDFs in default constraints. The only limitation that you should be aware of is that a UDF cannot accept columns from the table as inputs when used in a default constraint.
this code creates a table called T1 and a UDF called FNT1 jetted, which returns the minimum missing ID in T1. This code adds a default constraint to ID, which invokes the FNT1 jetted function. The following code inserts three rows, generating the keys 1, 2, and 3, deletes the row with the key 2 and inserts another row, generating the key 2. Notice that key 2 was assigned to the row that was inserted last, because the row with the key 2 was previously deleted. Part 3, UDFs used in primary key and unique constraints. You can create a unique or primary key constraint on a computed column that invokes a UDF. Keep in mind that both constraints create a unique index under the covers. This means that the target computed column and the UDF it invokes must meet indexing guidelines. For example, the UDF must be schema bound, created with the schema binding option. The computed column must be deterministic and precise or deterministic and persisted, and so on. You can find the details about indexing guidelines for computed columns and UDFs in SQL Server Books Online. This code attempts to add to T1 a computed column called Col2, which invokes the FN add UDF, and create a unique constraint on that column. The error occurs because the function doesn't meet one of the requirements for indexing, which says that the function must be schema bound. As you can see, the error message itself is not too helpful in indicating the cause of the error or in suggesting how to fix it. You need to realize that to fix the problem, you should alter the function by adding the schema binding option. Try adding the computed column with a unique constraint again. This time your code runs successfully. It's a bit trickier when you try to create a primary key constraint on such a computed column. To see how this works, first drop the existing primary key from T1. Next, attempt to add another computed column called col3 with a primary key constraint. The attempt fails, generating the following error.
you must explicitly guarantee that Colter never ends up with a null. You can achieve this by defining the column as persisted and not null. Part 4, Inline Table Value Due DFs Inline table value due DFs are similar to views in the sense that their return table is defined by a query specification. However, a UDFs query can refer to input parameters, while a view cannot. So you can think of an inline UDF as a parameterized view. SQL Server actually treats inline UDFs very similarly to views. The query processor replaces an inline UDF reference with its definition, in other words, the query processor expands the UDF definition and generates an execution plan accessing the underlying objects. Unlike scalar and multi-statement table value due DFs, you don't specify a begin, end block in an inline UDF's body. All you specify is a return clause and a query. In the function's header, you simply state that it returns a table. Run the following queries. Part 5, Multi-Statement Table Value Due DFs. A Multi-Statement Table Value Due DF is a function that returns a table variable. The function has a body with the sole purpose of populating the table variable. You develop a multi-statement table value due df when you need a routine that returns a table, and the implementation of the routine cannot be expressed as a single query, instead, it requires multiple statements, for example, flow elements such as loops. A multi-statement table value due df is used in a similar manner to an inline table value due df, but it cannot be a target of a modification statement, that is, you can use it only in the from clause of a select query. Internally, SQL Server treats the two completely differently. An inline new df is treated more like a view, as a table expression. A multi-statement table value due df is treated more like a stored procedure. As with other UDFs, a multi-statement table value due df is not allowed to have side effects. This function will return all the cars, which name is equal to the pcar name parameter, and all the cars, which name starts with the second letter of the pcar name parameter. In this way, you can run the multi-statement table value due df. Part 
Part 6, Perot UDFs. Non-deterministic functions are functions that are not guaranteed to return the same output when invoked multiple times with the same input. When you invoke non-deterministic built-in functions in a query, such as rand and got date, those functions are invoked once for the whole query and not once per row. The only exception to this rule is the NUID function, which generates a globally unique identifier. NUID is the only non-deterministic built-in function that will be invoked once per row. To demonstrate this behavior of non-deterministic functions, run the following code. Suppose that you needed to invoke the RAND function for each row. You might have thought of invoking RAND from a UDF and then invoking the UDF in an outer query, knowing that a UDF is invoked once per row. However, this attempt fails and produces the error. The error tells you that your function is not allowed to have side effects, and the RAND function does change an internal state for use in a subsequent invocation of RAND. A backdoor allows you to implicitly invoke RAND from a UDF. Create a view that invokes RAND and query the view from the UDF. We have achieved the desired effect, which shows the second query. Do you want to learn new skills in the fastest and most effective way? Visit Learn with Video Tutorials.com